Hello everyone, my name is Lindsay Sapansky and I am a board certified women's health nurse practitioner. I am one of the clinical educators here at Precision Analytical and today we are going to go over a case study of a regular cycling female that is trying to optimize her fertility chances and some implementations that she and her provider added to her treatment plan after getting results of her cycle map back. She also paired it with a Dutch complete. I think you'll find it fascinating and guess what, it ends in a success story. Yay! Just as a reminder, the information in this presentation is provided for informational and educational purposes only and it is not medical or treatment advice. Any information and statements regarding dietary or herbal supplements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration and are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. The use of any information provided in this presentation is solely at your own risk. Here are today's objectives. We're gonna walk through a cycle map of a regular cycling female trying to optimize fertility. We're also gonna briefly identify some areas on the Dutch Complete from the same patient, the same cycle that can also use some support. And we're gonna review some common methods that were implemented to help the menstrual cycle and ovarian health that resulted in a success story. Also, today's case study is not meant to be a comprehensive overview of infertility and all the things that contribute to fertility struggles and will not cover all areas to evaluate and treatment options available. Today's case study is going to be brief, maybe about 15 minutes of overview of how to use the Dutch uh, cycle map uh, paired with the Dutch complete to try to identify some areas that may help to optimize a woman's chance of achieving a successful pregnancy. And even in today's walkthrough, it will not cover all the things that could be evaluated as each person will have different markers and underlying causes that need attention. Anyone here that has done any small amount of diving into fertility and supportive measures knows that even after a full sem semester course specifically, addressing fertility, you will still not have all the answers. Fertility is that complex. However, I think after today and walking through some key data points that the Dutch testing can offer, you will find that it helps to add to the whole clinical workup of your fertility patients and some areas that may need some TLC. Also keep your eye on, e on your emails coming soon for an exclusive training course for Dutch providers. It's a free five-part masterclass to boost your understanding of hormones and their role in practicing functional medicine. If you are not already a Dutch provider, get signed up so you can get access to those mastering functional medicine courses when they are released. All right, let's get into the good stuff. We're gonna jump into this case study so you can see how Dutch testing helps this patient and uh, help best meet her needs and goals. Let's meet Mia. Mia is a married 39-year-old female, a G3P1. Her first pregnancy was normal, uncomplicated, uh, pregnant after only about three months of trying at the age of 32. Uh, she had a normal spontaneous delivery at 40 weeks, two days, and no complications at delivery. Uh, she never used contraception after that first child. She did experience a spontaneous miscarriage at eight weeks at the age of 36. She also experienced another spontaneous miscarriage at eight weeks at the age of 38. Neither she or her husband are interested in fertility treatments or an expensive uh, workup. Uh, some things about Mia, uh, the, she is overweight with an elevated BMI at 29.8. She follows the standard American diet, so not very healthy. Uh, however, she does stay well hydrated with adequate water intake. Uh, she works in a very fast paced medical office. It's a stressful environment for her. She's a non-smoker, uh, averages about two to three drinks a week. Her past medical history, uh, she had hypothyroid with her first pregnancy. The, this most recent thyroid workup is all normal. She has not been on any thyroid medication since that pregnancy. She does have low vitamin D levels. Uh, however, all of her other labs were normal. Serum labs that were done on day three and day 21 of her cycle. We're not gonna go into serum labs today because we're going over the Dutch test, but just so you have for reference, those were all within normal limits. Her husband has not done any semen testing, although blood work was all normal on him. There's no family history of congenital anom anomalies noted either. Um, so Mia reports very regular cycles. She used to have 28 day cycles prior to her first miscarriage and then kind of slipped into 26 day cycles. Her day two of her cycle is really heavy, soaking through a pad and a tampon every two hours. Her cycles are lasting about four to five days on average. She has noted in the last four years that cramping during her cycle uh, has worsened and also her PMS symptoms a week prior to menses have increased. 
Uh, she does experience cervical mucus changes on average around ovulation. Uh, so typically she said it's around day 12 to 15 of her cycle. And in the past, she has used the ovulation predictor kits, the OPKs, and consistently she had a positive OPK typically around days 12 to 14 of her cycle. Um, so typically she has 26 day cycles. When she did her cycle map, the collections for that, she actually had a 27 day cycle. This is still considered normal, but you know, interesting that she happened to have just an extra day in there on the day that she collected. Uh, these are Mia's cycle map results. This happened to, again to be a 27 day cycle. The graphs at the top are your, in the green here, represent estrogen production. And the bottom graphs in purple represent progesterone. Uh, production. The horizontal axis here is going to give you uh, the cycle days in length, so anywhere from zero to 30 plus days. And then the vertical axis is going to give you the um, hormone concentration or hormone metabolites that are being measured. A healthy cycle typically ranges from 24 to 35 days. Your patient's going to submit many samples over one cycle per the instructions provided. Uh, however, the lab is really only going to probably graph out or map out nine. They're going to select nine of the most relevant measurements to graph out. And this helps to best represent overall patterns of ovulatory and luteal uh, peaks. The cycle mapping collection will stop once the menstrual cycle starts. And then the patient will collect their four-day samples on day four of the next cycle. That four point collection is used to gather the rest of the data needed for the Dutch complete or the Dutch plus. Uh, but the, that day four is actually, day four of the next cycle is actually graphed out at the front of your cycle map. Uh, and that's to help so you can get, um, you know, a visual or reflection of what the estrogen progesterone are doing, are doing during the follicular phase of that menstrual cycle. If a Dutch complete or Dutch plus was ordered and paired with a cycle map, which is very common uh, because your cycle map is only going to give you estrogen and progesterone metabolites throughout the month. So most of the time providers and patients are pairing it with a Dutch complete or a Dutch plus. So you can kind of get that bigger overview of the estrogen metabolism, the adrenals, the androgens, you get your oats, things like that. So when it's paired together, um, which is common, when you're looking at your Dutch complete or your Dutch plus, uh, they're going to graph out the estrogen and progesterone metabolites that come from the highest peak of the beta pregnant dial in that luteal phase of the menstrual cycle. You'll see on the graphs down on their cycle map, there's a day that's kind of lightly grayed, highlighted day that shows the highest beta pregnant dial peak in that mid luteal phase. That's where they're going to take the estrogen metabolites and the progesterone metabolites from that day. And that's the day that they'll graph out on your Dutch complete or your Dutch plus. Uh, I kind of highlighted it here where you can see that this happened on day 22 of her menstrual cycle on Mia cycle that she had her highest peak. The first part of the cycle, those first typically days one through 14 are what we call the follicular phase. And then we have our ovulation, which typically occurs mid cycle. And then we have our second half of the cycle, which we call the luteal phase. Um, so you'll see that second half of the cycle, and that's when progesterone actually surges, is in that second half of the cycle. Uh, these phases may shift in patients with an atypical cycle length. So this may not look, you know, as typical if they have really irregular periods or they're having anovulatory cycles, things like that. The levels may still be considered normal if someone has a short cycle or a long cycle. Uh, so for instance, if someone typically ovulates on day 10 of their cycle, they get a peak a little bit earlier than you would see on this uh, lightly grayed graph here. Or if they maybe ovulate on day 17 of their menstrual cycle, you might see that estrogen peak after, you know, this lightly grayed area. That still can be considered normal. You just kind of have to kind of shift how you're looking at those, those graphs a little bit. But the lightly grayed area is kind of a normal reference range for a regular cycling 28 day cycle. Um, so that's kind of where you, when you can kind of see, did they fall within those ranges at the different times of the cycles? At the top of the graphs, we follow both the primary estrogens. So we're following the estrone and the estro estradiol. In a typical cycle, estrogen starts to rise in the follicular phase and it's going to peak up at ovulation 
which stimulates the luteinizing hormone surge from the brain about 24 to 36 hours before ovulation. And then this will lead to the production of progesterone in that second half of the cycle. We measure that by measuring the beta and alpha pregnadiol metabolites of progesterone. So that's where they're graphed out down here. Progesterone really only rises after ovulation has occurred and it'll peak about five to seven days after ovulation. And then if we don't get pregnant, you're gonna see that progesterone kind of come back down back, uh, and go back down to baseline for menses. When progesterone does not rise, it indi indicates that the patient is likely not ovulating. So if you kind of see these flat purple lines when you get your cycle maps back, it's likely they're not having ovulatory cycles. Or in the case of Mia, you might see a really weak rise in the progesterone. So you see that it, you know, she had this rise of estrogen, this little bit of a peak of estrogen at ovulation, and then it starts to come back down and kind of plateau during the luteal phase. But it was enough of a peak to cause ovulation because we can see the progesterone kind of came up. However, it's a really weak response. She had a weak corpus luteum or a weak progesterone rise. Uh, when we see that weak rise, it can either indicate no ovulation or a luteal phase defect because that weak corpus luteum. Uh, this is very associated very often with poor egg quality. Um, also, we can see that it can affect um, maintaining the secretory endometrium and it linked to infertility when we don't see that nice rise in progesterone in that second half of the cycle. Ranges for progesterone during the first half of the cycle, during the follicular and ovulatory phase of the cycle, actually are pretty close or similar to postmenopausal ranges. So they typically stay pretty low during that first half of the cycle. Then again, after ovulation, you're gonna see that progesterone peak up. Um, I, this table here is typically underneath these graphs when you're looking at um, a cycle map, but I just kind of put them side by side just for easy viewing. But typically you'll see these graphed out underneath down here. Um, but just so you can see them here, I kind of highlighted here on day 12 of her menstrual cycle, that's when you're seeing her estrogen peak up. So her estrogen peaked up around day 12, so she probably ovulated around day 12, 13 of her menstrual cycle. And then she had her highest beta pregnant dial peak in that second half on day 22 of her menstrual cycle. You also can see normal reference ranges down below here for follicular phase, ovulatory phase, and luteal phase. So you can always take these individual uh, days here and see, did they fall within range depending on where they were at in their menstrual cycle? But you can see here that she, you know, got a rise of her estrogen and, and then it'll kind of come back down and plateau, but she kind of stays high with her estradiol throughout that luteal phase. And in fact, she's kind of popping above range here in a couple of those data points that you'd be able to see. Um, for instance, like on day 19 of her cycle, her estradiol was above range. And so uh, it was kind of popping above range. Go back real quick. Um, but then, you know, she we can see she's got this weak progesterone response in that second half of the cycle. All right, let's slide over to the Dutch uh, complete results. This happens to be on page one of the report. Uh, so you'll see the adrenal, there's a box for the adrenal hormones down on page one. And you can see for total DHEA production, which is coming from the adrenals, we get this by adding up the downstream metabolites of the DHEA to get this value. Uh, you can see she's a little below range for her age range. So for a 20 to 39 year old, she should be between 1300 and 3000, and she was only at 1258. And then we have our metabolized cortisol. You'll see in parentheses down here, total cortisol production. So this dial here helps to answer the question, can the adrenals even make any cortisol? This is roughly about 70 to 80% of our total output for the day. Whereas this dial right here, this 24 hour free cortisol, the 79 dial, they got that by adding up her four individual samples for the day. This dial here helps, is your free cortisol, which really only makes up about one to 5% of our total output for the day. And in an ideal situation, those two dials would be pointing somewhat roughly in the same direction because then they'd be telling the same story. So if we have adequate output, there should be adequate free. But in her case, those two dials have now pulled away from each other. We can see that the metabolized cortisol is a lot higher than her total free cortisol. And when we see this pattern, we think of this as a hypermetabolic pattern. Something is starting to speed up the metabolism of the cortisol and it's starting to wipe out the free cortisol a little bit too quickly. 
not leaving as much in the free bioavailable form. We oftentimes see this in, in obesity or elevated BMI, so a very common presentation with that. You may also see this with hyperthyroid or if they're taking too high of a thyroid dosage. Uh, you'll see it with your chronic stress patients, blood sugar dysregulation patients. Uh, so you can see that she's kind of got this impaired cortisol clearance pattern going on. It's starting, the metabolic rate is kind of speeding up a little bit. And then we also can look at her individual data points for the day. Did she get a nice rise and fall for the day with her free cortisol? You can see it's a pretty weak response in the morning. She really didn't get a nice rise in the morning. She does stay within range for afternoon and nighttime, but that really wasn't a nice peak. So she's maybe not getting that nice kickstart in the morning. This is going to be, uh, these two dials up here are from page one. They put these two dials next to each other on page one, but then we also have our page three results where we can actually see that estrogen um, metabolism and how it's graphed out. Uh, we already saw from the cycle map that we knew she was estrogen dominant in that luteal phase of the menstrual cycle, and she had a weak progesterone response. So those two dials are kind of pointing towards each other when ideally we would like to see the progesterone a lot higher and the estrogen, you know, within range especially for a fertility patient. Um, when you're on page three, uh, that's where you get to see how the estrogen detoxification pathways are. So we can see that she was a little robust with her estradiol. Uh, her E1 and her E3 were in range. We can see her progesterone metabolites. Again, these are graphed out from the data that we got from her highest beta pregnadiol peak in that mid luteal phase that we saw on the cycle map. So that's where the estrogen and progesterone uh, dials are coming from. And we know she was a little robust there, but let's see how is she detoxifying those estrogens. So you have your green arrow, red arrow, and blue arrow, and you have a pie chart to the right of it. That's all part of phase one. The pie chart's just a different visual representation. And underneath the pie chart, you're going to see patient percentages. So of those estrogens coming downstream, what percentage is hitting each of those pathways? And for her phase one, she actually looks pretty good. She's sending an adequate amount of estrogens down her 2-OH, her 4-OH, and her 16-OH. She's not pushing too heavily down uh, either or any of those pathways. Where she does look like she's struggling a little bit though is her phase two. And that's where you follow the green arrow down to the 2-OH, it goes to the left, it uses the COMP-T enzyme for methylation to the 2-methoxy. And this fan gauge to the far left here is showing us how well are we methylating those estrogens to get them ready for clearance out of the body. And ideally on this fan gauge, we want to be mid to high because we want to be good methylators. We want to be able to get these estrogens out. Uh, so when it starts to lean to the low side like that, uh, I start to think of this as the clog in the drain. We need to open up that clog so those estrogens can get out. And things that are going to be supportive here are going to be things that help support the COMP-T enzyme, uh, which are going to be your methyl donors. Um, when we look at her androgens, if you remember from page one, we saw her total DHEA, which was a little below range for her age range. But when we get to page three, we get to see where did that DHEA go? How much of that DHEA went to the DHEAS form? And if we keep following those arrows downstream, how much went down the five beta pathway to the ediocalanolone? That's a less androgenic pathway. And then we have the five alpha pathway that's going to the androsterone, which is a more androgenic pathway. I always recommend below this 5-alpha reductase activity, you're going to see a box below there for age-dependent ranges. Always check that box to see, did they even fall into range with those metabolites? And I kind of suspected she was going to be low in some of her metabolites because she was already low with her total DHEA. She doesn't have as much to pour downstream. Uh, there's one little caveat here when it comes to the testosterone. Whenever you see the testosterone this low, uh, we don't have enough time to kind of go over it completely, um, but you can read more about it on the back pages of the report. It's typically on pages 10 and 11 of the report, but we call it the UGT variant. And whenever you see urinary testosterone this low, it's always recommended to double check testosterone in a serum level, oftentimes looking at a free and a total testosterone in a serum. Uh, that's considered the gold standard. There's nothing wrong with Mia. She just excretes her testosterone differently. Therefore, we get falsely low urinary testosterone levels. So that's why I kind of put a little red X there. Uh, and I put this red disclaimer down here is just whenever we see it this low, it fits what we call the UGT variant. And uh, you would follow and monitor testosterone through serum because she just excretes it differently. And so you get falsely low levels. On page five of the report, we get to see, uh, you know, what are they doing with those cortisol patterns? Uh, 
you also get to see the melatonin. Her melatonin was at 22 on our test. If it's 25 or less, it's considered below range or deficient. So she's looking like she could uh, really work on maybe some sleep hygiene or maybe possible some melatonin support, depending on uh, her sleep cycles and um, antioxidants and things like that. Um, we already saw the metabolized cortisol and the 24-hour free cortisol from page one, but they also graph these out on page five, so you can see them again here. Uh, when we see the daily free cortisol pattern and the daily free cortisol pattern, these two are basically one of the same. Free cortisol deactivates to free cortisone in specific tissues, and if the body were to need it again throughout the day, technically we could reactivate it back to free cortisol via the 11-beta HSD 1 and 2 enzyme. Free cortisol deactivates to free cortisone in the kidney based on electrolyte needs, blood volume, and blood pressure regulation needs. Uh, and in this case, typically these two red graphs and dials usually mimic each other. They look fairly similar. They'll follow somewhat of a similar pattern. But you can see in this case, Mia's got a little bit more of the free cortisone around than she does the free cortisol. That dial is looking higher than that free cortisol there. And you can see in the graph, it's a little bit higher. So this likely means that there was more cortisol than you think coming through the system into the kidney and getting deactivated to the, into the cortisone. The kidney, as well as other glands, can deactivate cortisol to cortisone to protect itself. Uh, the kidney and salivary glands have a mineral corticoid receptor, and when high levels of cortisol are coming through, they'll kind of deactivate cortisone. Uh, so basically, when you see this picture, uh, they're bringing cortisol to the, to the tissue, but it's getting deactivated or getting turned off in a sense. And remember, when we see that high metabolized cortisol in comparison to a lower free cortisol, like we saw on page one, they put those two dials next to each other, uh, but you can see that they pulled away. Think of those hypermetabolic pattern, obesity, hyperthyroid, chronic stress, blood sugars, things like that. Here's the treatment plan for Mia. So th this is a little intense. Mia was motivated. So when she got her test back, she just, it gave her a lot of data and a lot of tangible things to work on. And she wanted to feel better and improve overall health. The last two miscarriages had really taken a toll on her physically and mentally. Uh, and she was ready. And she told her provider that she was ready to, for her fabulous 40s coming up and she wanted to feel good. Uh, so her provider had, had when we were going over this uh, report in this case, had, had said this is a pretty robust plan, more, you know, pretty more than her typical plans. But Mia was really motivated and wanted to get things kickstarted and had agreed that after three months they would decrease supplements and eliminate some altogether. But Mia kept calling this plan her booster pack plan. So, you know, she was motivated to get those three months to kind of kickstart things. And then she, um, you know, the plan was to back off on some of this. Uh, so here's some of the the treatment plan that they were had implemented. Some general liver, um, general support. They added in some liquid omegas, essential fatty acids. It's been helpful for healthy hormone regulation, essential for brain development, and fetus, anti-inflammatory. Um, for her multivitamin, she used desiccated liver capsules, two capsules orally, twice a day. It's a good source of iron, B vitamins, vitamin A, things like that. Um, but there have been studies that showed significant improvement in pregnancy rates in women who were on a, multi, you know, a multiple micronutrient supplement compared to folic acid alone. And they also had uh, associated better birth outcomes than folic acid and iron alone. Uh, so she kind of wanted to get, um, you know, that kind of support of just getting a good multivitamin going. Uh, vitamin D3, uh, the research has shown that deficiencies have uh, shown some congenital abnormal abnormalities. Uh, it's also an antioxidant and can support production of estrogen in some cases. Uh, she also added in a probiotic, uh, which is uh, important for healthy gut microbiome. Uh, she also added in the liposomal glutathione. It's a master antioxidant and may be helpful for follicular development in the aging ovary as well. So there is some fertility support there as well. Uh, Mia also wanted to do castor oil liver packs. She wanted to do this to help with detoxification of the liver and improve hormone metabolism with improved liver function. Uh, for progesterone support, because remember she had that low progesterone in that luteal phase, she added in chase tree berry. It's also called Vitex. Uh, and this, you know, we need adequate progesterone to support the luteal phase, because if the luteal phase isn't long enough, it, it can't support implanta implantation. 
And we also need it for continuation of progesterone synthesis by the corpus luteum. So we, we need this nice progesterone response in that second half of the cycle to have successful pregnancies. Uh, Mia added in magnesium uh, because she had noticed on her estrogen detoxification pathways that phase two, that comp T enzyme was on the sluggish side. So added in magnesium to help with methylation. It's also been shown to be involved with estrogen and progesterone synthesis. And some studies have shown deficiencies have been linked to female infertility. So just kind of an overall there. Uh, she added in a B complex again to help with that um, estrogen comp T metabolism, uh, get things moving through. It's also, you know, B complex uh, is also important. All those Bs are important for fetal development. Um, with the general liver support, in addition to those castor oil liver packs, uh, she'd added in a milk thistle capsule and sulforaphane capsule every day um, to kind of help with general liver support and sulfation support for those detoxification of the hormones. She also did a local herbal blend tea from her local herbalist uh, that had uh, some herbs in there that were not only have been shown to help with menstrual health, but liver support. Uh, so I, those are added in there, just kind of what was in that blend. Uh, also for adrenal support, um, she started exercising. She started doing 30 minutes a day on the treadmill at 3.5 miles per hour at a 2.5 to 3% incline. She wasn't very active prior to that. Um, it's also a really good stress reducer and is beneficial to the adrenals. So that's important for, you know, overall pregnancy success as well. Uh, she really improved her protein uh, intake. It's important for hor healthy hormone production, but also to help with blood sugar balancing throughout the day. Sleep hygiene. Remember, she had that low melatonin. Uh, so she really started working on it, uh, better sleep hygiene practices, shutting off the phone and the TV an hour before bed. Uh, the cold, dark room, blackout curtains, sound machine, and then in the morning was opening up those curtains, getting that full spectrum light, letting that light get in so cortisol would rise up. So really trying to work on that diurnal pattern. Um, she also um, added in acupuncture. Uh, the, the studies have mixed results on outcomes, but there have been studies that have shown uh, clinical pregnancy rates significantly higher in acupuncture treatment groups. Uh, so she only had one session. Uh, the plan was to go for every six weeks, but she did go to acupuncture once. Uh, she also wanted to add in an adrenal cocktail every morning, trying to help get that cortisol, you know, feeding the adrenals, you know, helping to get things to boost up in the morning and help with that kickstart throughout the day. Uh, so she had uh, an adrenal cocktail. There's lots of recipes out there, but this one, um, it, you know, she was using like an orange juice with a pinch of sea salt. Um, she also had been juicing ginger and uh, turmeric, and she was doing a tablespoon of that added into her OJ uh, Shashandra tincture, which uh, to help with uh, just overall adaptogenic support and some trace minerals um, that she and then she also was putting her liquid omegas in there too, uh, to kind of to help with. Uh, you know, kind of feeding those adrenals. She also added in a zinc. Uh, it's very deficient in the modern diet and it's, a set, it's essential for proper cell division and fetal growth. She added in some berberine. Uh, this can help with insulin resistance and blood sugars. You know, she had an elevated BMI, a little overweight, so kind of added that in. Um, for the adrenal support, when we see that higher cortisone, that deactivated and compared to the free cortisol, uh, there is some... Um, Sometimes people will use licorice, and then she did that. It helps to prevent the cortisol from deactivating as quickly to the free cortisone. So it can maybe help boost that cortisol in the morning to help with energy and focus and kind of help get them through the day. So she added just a little bit into her adrenal cocktail every morning just to try to help get that, that boost. She also had low melatonin, uh, so to help with more uh, a more restorative restful sleep. It's also an antioxidant, and research has been shown that it can help with fertility and also can help with weight loss efforts and leptin resistance. So she had added in melatonin, three milligrams, to help get into a more restorative restful sleep, but also for that fertility benefit. The plan was for her to follow up in three months. Uh, the goal was that she was going to decrease or eliminate supplements that she no longer needed. She was going to repeat the cycle map at three months, and then she was going to repeat the Dutch complete paired with the cycle map in six months to kind of help with costs. So originally she was going to do that th cycle map at three months to see if that progesterone had improved in that luteal phase. Um, however, after only two months, she was pregnant with a healthy, viable pregnancy. She went on to deliver full term at 40 weeks in one day. 
at the age of 39. It was a month before she was going to hit her fabulous 40s. Happy, pleasantly surprised, both her and her husband. She reports that she kind of really was focusing on the healing and cleaning up areas of her test and hadn't really been thinking about the pregnancy occurring so quickly. Uh, So maybe that adds a little bit of a component to it too, or decreasing that stress around uh, pregnancy. But uh, she said that she had those tangible things to look at from the report of things that she could work on and thinking that, you know, it was going to take easily three to six months for those things to boost. So it was kind of a nice, nice ending for her and her husband. Um, I added a few resources. You can find this all on our website on the dutchtest.com website, uh, just your main website. But there's, you know, if you want to do a deeper dive in fertility, there's uh, a handful of webinars, some blog posts, some podcasts, um, some videos here that you might find helpful of just kind of filling in some of the, the areas for fertility and optimizing there. Uh, and then also some references here too. So sometimes just digging into those helps send you down another uh, path or more articles pop up. Uh, so, you know, do some, you, you, there's some cool stuff out there related to fertility. As you know, it's complex. Um, but thank you. Thank you for joining me today uh, to review a quick case that the patient and the provider were able to work together to find a treatment plan that ultimately ended in a successful pregnancy. Uh, also, don't forget to check out the main website, dutchtest.com, for many resources, webinars, case studies, podcasts, blog posts. Have a great day.